And it took 65 years before we recognized the girls who'd flown Spitfires and bombers in World War II. There were actually quite a few women in America flying, but very quickly, you know, World War I, it just, it, it, nobody could fly as a civilian pilot. Everybody was grounded. These, these girls in aviation were taking jobs that rightfully belonged to men. He pulled out the pink slip and he put it on top of his clipboard and my heart just went. You know, my attitude to that is get off your backside there, the armchair critics, and go and try to do it. Tracy, how are you? Good morning. I'm very well, thank you. Yes, uh, um, you're, you're you're looking very well, um, Tracy. I'm I'm so humbled and honoured to meet you. Um, I've got to talk because I'm a podcast. <laughs> so I better say something. But um, kick it off, Chris. Kick yes, it off. I I noticed something in, in when I was reading a, a a a bit of your memoir. Bird friends, link below from what I've read so far. This is a book that you want to read. There's a link below. But uh, you mentioned, um, I think it was uh, misogyny in the kind of aviation field. Um, and I just wanted to say off the bat that the reason I got my pilot's license, dun, 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 <laughs> um, it, it, it came up off the back of a conversation I had with a girl in New Zealand. And we were doing our, uh, stage one of the AFF skydiving course. And we'd done, we'd just done our first jump and we were in the hangar and we were having a chat and she said to me, oh, I'm a pilot. I think one thing that I've noticed is a bit different about me to a lot of people I meet is immediately, Tracy, I was just fascinated. I want to hear all about this. How, how do you get a pilot license? What what is it to, you know, take take off in a plane and successfully? La and she was telling me stuff about, well, Chris, you move from airspace to airspace and you've got to radio into the air traffic control to ask for permission. to and, and I just found it fascinating, Tracy. And so when I got back to the UK, I booked myself um, on a course in Florida, a place called Fort Pierce. And... Lo and behold, after some three, it might have been three and a half weeks of intense study, finally got to take my pilot test. It was about eight hours long, passed a whole series of exams before it. And when my, it was a Swedish chap, um, turned to me and said, I'll tell you what he did. You have a like a pink slip. It means you failed. And you have a green one that means you pass and, and, this uh, this swine, <laughs> he pulled out the pink slip and he put it on top of his clipboard and my heart just went. Failed again, Chris. Failed yet, a, yet another thing in you. <laughs> and then he went, oh, no, this is the one I want. And he pulled out the... Getting emotional, Tracy, just thinking about it. It, it was a phenomenal experience, but... Going back to the um, the misogyny bit, you know, it was a uh, it was a girl that got me into flying, and I I'm a bit a uh, bit shocked to bit shocked to hear that some blokes are a bit offish in this uh, in this community. Why would that surprise you, Chris? I mean, given your military background, I mean, funny enough, when you look at the history of aviation, and of course, my flights, I was following the female pioneers of the air in that interwar period and learning about some of the hostility that they were up against and this and this very uh, you know this this hostile male establishment which was had been created by the military can i just say you know this came from world war one mm. 
in the early, early years of aviation, um, certainly in America, there were, there were actually quite a lot of women flying. And I'm talking about, you know, the Wright brothers in 1903. So in that decade before World War I, there were actually quite a few women in America flying. But very quickly, you know, World War I, it just, it, it, nobody could fly as a civilian pilot. Everybody was grounded. And this is where that whole hierarchy and culture was created. And it didn't permit women. I mean, and almost if you look at all of the 20th century, it was about how women were blocked from aviation. I mean, just talking about this particular industry. In Britain, some 30,000 women worked in World War I making aeroplanes around the aviation industry. They were part of the RAF, the Royal Flying Corps. Not one of them had a job in civilian aviation in the interwar period. Then, of course, we had the famous ATA, the Air Transport Auxiliary in World War II, which started off as 12 women flying tiger moths at Hatfield. And this was a really big political issue, let me tell you. Can we possibly allow women? The fact that, you know, we obviously biologically different, we menstruate, that was a big problem. And quite honestly, it wasn't until, what, 1990 that we allowed women into the military in this country. And it took 65 years before we recognized the girls who'd flown Spitfires and bombers in World War II. 65 years to recognize. And that only happened, what, 15 years ago. So this attitude is absolutely entrenched in aviation. Now, it's changing. It's not changing quickly enough. But it was the military that created that hierarchy and that culture that, that blocked women from participating. Yes. I probably not shocked Tracy, just disappointed, really. Um, hence why you're my wonderful guest today. <laughs> I don't know if you've read any Naomi Wolf. She wrote a book, and in, in in the book, she highlighted exactly what you said. She said, you know, prior to war, all the TV advertising is, hey, girls, you know, get your washing up gloves on and your soft fairy liquid to do your dishes and, you know, put all this makeup on, 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 on. Da, 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 da. When war breaks out, all that, the, that narrative changes. And it's like, right, girls, get in the factories. And, and what did they do? They got in the factories and they did the job better than the blokes. And they're churning out aircraft after aircraft or whatever, you know. Mute, mute, mute. And then, of course, when the war stops, it's right, girls. Back to happy families, you know. Get your get your marigolds on, and 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 yes, in, incredibly raw. Isn't that you then get accused, and they were accused after after World War Two in America. These these girls in aviation were taking jobs that rightfully belonged to men. So these sorts of attitudes, and and you know, we think we're in a sort of enlightened age and an in an enlightened country, but you can see some of the problems we've had recently with the CBI. You know, the biggest governmental lobbying group, the Met Police. Look at the attitudes towards women. And I think this is one of the biggest problems confronting the world today. Apart from global warming and all the rest of it, and wars in Ukraine, it is how women are treated in society. Yes. So there's, there's a much bigger issue, this, this imbalance of power. It's, it's how, you know, and it's, it's only recently when you look at the developments in aviation, some of these pioneering women who were striving to sort of work as commercial pilots, and they were banned from doing that in the early 1920s. The International you know, Civil Aviation Organization, actually it was illegal for women to fly in commercial airspace, even though they could hold a commercial license. So as well as doing the flying, you were also struggling to try and get, you know, just get the recognition, get the same status, earn the same pay, get the vote. You know, so when you look at what the women were up against, I think their achievements are exponentially greater than the, the pioneering male flyers because of what they're up against. And and look, you know, when I when I juxtapose that with some of the experience I've had, I mean, I've had an unusual career in aviation. I wouldn't even describe it as a career because mine was driven by by um, a kind of romantic idea of flight and, and a passion for flying, but I could never join the military. It never even occurred to me. You know, I'm at a Northern Comprehensive in, in, in the north of England. You couldn't join the air cadets. I didn't go to university. You couldn't join the air squadron. You couldn't join the military. And in fairness, it didn't even occur to me. There was no career advice. 
So I ended up coming at flying almost circuitously. You know, I, I loved watching those magnificent men in their flying machines was just a, a huge driver for me. I just love that whole mad romantic adventure of it. You know, I had my first flying lesson at 16 in Canada, just just completely random. With You know, my twin sister and I had flown in an airliner, absolutely loved it. And then I saw, you know, uh, some friends live near an airfield and I saw a sign advertising introductory flights and I went and had a flight. So that was 16, but I, I couldn't afford to fly in Britain. You know how expensive everything is here. It just wasn't feasible or accessible in any way. So it wasn't until I moved to New Zealand in, in the sort of mid 80s that I started in earnest. And I just then waitress modeled, worked on garage forecourts. I just, you know, all manner of you know, manual jobs just to pay for my flying. So in some respects, that was the hardest part of it, paying for it. If you live in the city I live in, if you go out the front door, every young girl is dressed in pink. Every young. And I said to my friend once, uh, he's got three, uh, four girls now, I think. And I said, you know, what's the, the like the pink deal? Do you, are you trying to like stereotype your daughters from birth to be, like fluffy and print and he said chris it's not that he said you can't buy anything for young girls that's not pink and i don't know if friends at home get this but i i just see like a deep deep programming um in there and when i brought this up on my my youth work course which is all about equality and you know i'm hold my hand up um, i'm a feminist if that means that we should have equal blooming rights I got looked at like a scant by my <laughs> by my fellows. They just didn't get. They were like, "What? What's wrong with wearing pink?" I well, was nothing, nothing wrong with wearing pink per se. Well, it's true. You you do look at this, and you are you ask. That's right. We just is this gender thing so prescribed that that we all you know little boys drive tractors and have aeroplanes, and girls have their dolls and their pink frilly dresses. You know, and there's no doubt about it. There is there is social conditioning on that. But but also, you know, there is a great impetus towards these things. That's how they developed. That's how they became stereotypes. They were there kind of in the first place. So, you know, and when you look at, I mean, just to bring that debate to the whole idea of, you know, women in aviation, the fact that the statistics now, there's only something like 5% of commercial pilots that are women. And I, I think, now, why is that? Okay, because now there's fantastic scholarships, there's fantastic support. Uh, you know, all of this is accessible to women, and yet they don't seem to be stepping up to the plate. Now, I don't think it's ever going to be 50-50, but I'd like to think it might be 25-75 women, in, you know, women into a, you know, aviation, engineering, etc. But what is it? I, is, is, is the societal culture so great that it, you know, it's never going to be like that. So I, I don't know what to think about it, but I, but I do think that it needs to start in schools in terms of the opportunities that are out there. And it's not gender driven and it shouldn't be, obviously. You know, I mean, although, although you know, you can look at this, but when I get into an aeroplane, I'm not thinking, here I am a female flying. It's above gender. People who, you know, you desire to do it, they share, you share exactly the same passion. Everybody predominantly shares that dream of flight, don't they? But we've all got so bogged in the gender issue. And, and that's, it's just awful, actually. I just, I hope now that, you know, we finally are working towards something that resembles a level playing field. I know it's not. I know it's not. But, you know, we have to strive for that, don't we, to be equal partners in, in, in these things. Because I'm a veteran, Tracy, I see the way fellow veterans treat each other at times. Not, not, not all of them, folks. There's some wonderful, wonderful people in the, uh, for the vast majority of the veterans community. A, a lovely, lovely people, but some of them are just so bitter and 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 full of this outpouring of hatred to anyone that achieves anything. It's always you got to be, you got to tear them down. Um, rather than just say something nice, which I think is should be the only thing we say. So, um, You know what, Chris, I think that's an extraordinarily British thing mm -hmm. to drag people down. You know, it's that tall poppy syndrome. And I, and I don't really know why that is, whether we struggle so hard in this country, whether there's just too many of us. 
and it's just so difficult to get you know keep your head above the water that they resent it when when somebody goes out and achieves something because mm -hmm. success is regarded differently in America. The attitude there is can do. They applaud you for you know for trying. Never mind achieving, just for trying something. But here, there's a kind of simmering resentment, I, and I've I've certainly seen some of that. And I have to believe that some of that is envy, you know. But yes. you know, some of the some of the garbage that I was dealing with, and I, I don't want to preempt what's in the book here, but it tapped into a, a, a deep vein of misogyny and a kind of and a kind of envy, actually, and this sense, this rather cynical sense that that I had somehow been given everything on a plate, which just frankly staggers me it staggers me because this again this attitude which came predominantly from males you know it, it seems to me that the whole system is so weighted one way and yet they really don't like it when somebody you know somebody unusual breaks rank and does something unusual then it's like oh well it was easy for her you know she was given this you know she got the sponsorship well get out you know my attitude to that is get off your backsides then the armchair critics and go and try to do it because just doing something like this, it's not like if it was easy, believe me, more people would be doing it. I can tell you it is excruciatingly difficult. It took me four years to raise the money, to find the airplane, to build the team. And building the sponsorship was the single most difficult thing. So just to get in, to speak to people, you know, to, to, to build the, the whole momentum and impetus behind that but my god it was difficult so to then get these people who are then criticizing you oh you know she's claiming to fly solo she's not all this trivial white noise i just thought wow they have no idea what's involved so it's a terrible kind of ignorance actually yes people say is a reflection of what's going on in their their mind and their life, isn't it? You know, we need to recognise that. Um, it's kind of funny. I'm going to just big myself up here, Tracy, but I'm currently the uh, the English Veteran of the Year uh, for inspiration, okay? Congratulations. <laughs> um, and even though, you know, I host military or ve uh, veterans events, I've done an awful lot of work for military, you still get people online who don't believe that I've served <laughs> and it makes me chuckle a, because like, I literally don't care. You know, it, it, it was just a job I did. It was quite a long time ago. Now it, I've done lots of stuff in my life, folks. Um, but it makes me chuckle that you've got all these resources at hand o over the internet. You could literally just type my name into dare I say Google and you're going to just see immediately <laughs> all this information about me and yet um people live in this this little bubble where uh they have this thought right i don't think he's so and they're willing to just put that out <laughs> but these are the these are the classic conspiracy theorists aren't there this is the q and on people this is the you know but this is what the internet has done it's given everybody a voice and i mean certainly and i was subjected to the most extraordinary stuff but all anonymous. That's what cracked me up. Not only are they awful critics, they're just, they're cowards. But all these kind of, you know, failed, embittered, women-bashing individuals who were just out there on the internet in cyberspace. You know, and I just thought, what a, what a dreadful, what a dreadful kind of thing that is, really. But, mm. you know, you just have to rise above it and, and, and crack on with what you do. And, and the good people come with you. I do believe that, you know. Well, Tracy, I can tell you now, and I'll speak on behalf of our wonderful um, guest, uh, guest, our wonderful viewers out there and listeners, because we've got a great, great bunch of people. And I tell you what, you thoroughly uh, deserve all your accolades and your achievements are just incredible. And, and we don't need to defend ourselves against anyone, do we? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we, I don't need we don't, I don't need their approval. That's the point. I don't no. care. Anything, but it's amazing how how powerful you know they can make all sorts of garbage go viral. I mean, this is of course the really dark side of the internet, and and the sort of you know the 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 the, the, the opinion forums that are created, and they're just they're just insidious and you know they just become these echo chambers. So never mind all the things that you're trying to do. I mean, all I was trying to do is fly my aeroplane, you know, highlight what these uh, amazing female aviators have done to try and inspire the next generation and get more women in aviation and aerospace. 
And yet here you are, you get this, you know. Having said that, can I just qualify that by saying that the, the attacks that I was subjected to were driven by one individual who, guess what, was ex-military, you know, an angry little individual who came on board as our logistics manager in Africa. He drove the entire campaign. So you see, when I talk about the military, I've had fantastic support in the course of my life. All my early flying in New Zealand with the New Zealand warbirds, a lot of the people there were ex-military. You know, my flying at Shuttleworth for nine years, they were all military test pilots who fly the Shuttleworth collection, one of the rarest collections of flying airplanes in the world. So, you know, I, I've had an amazing experience with military people. You know, my experience with the Navy, they made me an, an honorary lieutenant commander. I've had fantastic support. It's just the occasional one, and this is where you come against this attitude, again, this, this entitlement, this obsession with power and control, and on some level, a kind of anger that you're dealing with. And they think, well, who is this woman? Who does she think she is? And I'm going to take her down. I'm going to, I'm going to put her in her place. So, so you know, the, the, the villains in my book, I hate to say it, but have, you know, were military people. And nice. that's what I about the attitude. So I'm sure you've encountered that. It's not just, you know, but I, I hand on heart, I, I, I don't think that had I been a male, I would have been subjected to some of the stuff I was subjected to. So as a female, you feel like you're a bit of a soft target for this stuff. And uh, I'm sure you're a much more wiser and tougher person for it, Tracy. <laughs> I, I, do you know what? I don't normally give this sort of thing airtime just simply because I don't believe in giving power to other. You, you, I, I live my life. I live in paradise. That's it, really. I want to come on and talk about your incredible story. I'm going to start right from the beginning. I've made, made a couple of notes there. Excuse me looking down, but uh, started flying at 16. Before I do that, can I, can I just do a second showing off? Do you, I don't know if you can see my shirt. I put it on specially. Do you know, I, I clocked that. Yes. The, have you been in a Spitfire? You're going to tell me you've yes. been in a Spitfire? Yes. Oh, you. Uh, wow. Well, okay. Now. The, I, I'm going to tell you the official spin, and, and then, I'll, then I'm going to, like, drag it down again. But ba basically, you know, I had a wonderful chap called Richard uh, contact me, big fan of the podcast. He said, Chris, do you want to um, fly a Spitfire? There's only one answer to that, folks, if you're a pilot, okay, and you 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 guess what that is. And um there's a slight catch, is it's a, a Spitfire simulator, but it is actually a Spitfire. It's the original um casing of a cockpit of a of a Second World War Spitfire. And what Richard's done is he's um turned it into a flight simulator. Okay. So you literally hop in in into this uh, this craft, and you put your Second World War that helmety thing. Goggles. That, uh, you put your goggles. Yes, on. yes, and he's big, big, and um, and it you can fly anywhere in the world that you want. So I pick my hometown, being a mil you know Plymouth, being a mil military uh, place, puts it into the computer, and the next thing you're you're literally taking um, taking off, flying, and landing just as you would in a in, in a real aircraft. And I can say that because obviously I've flown um, flown real real You've planes. Flown You've obviously <laughs> well you, tail draggers. Have you flown the old ones? Tail no, draggers. no. I, I'm I'm you know he, 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 in in the interest of openness, I've only flown Cessnas. I've only done. Um, I say only. I, I'm a private pilot, so um, is it single engine land? I guess la the land means as opposed to uh, a water boat, you know, a, a water bird rather. Um, but uh, oh, it's incredible, Tracy. The the whole history of it. The they set it up so it vibrates in the same way. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm vibrating now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take I'm going to take off. Um, but it it's just the full on experience. It was just utterly incredible. And Richard, if you're watching, um, can't. Th and, and also it's. It's like a 500 quid experience that Richard just very kindly gave me and my family. Um, yeah. It's quite funny. Well, you're 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 flying a Spitfire 
in wartime Plymouth, folks. And then your little boy like leans over your shoulder and says, all right, Dad. <laughs> all right, so. now, what are you like? <laughs> hey, well, listen, I'm going in a Concorde Spitfire uh, uh, simulator at Brooklands. So they do a, a similar thing. They do this um, experience that members of the public can go and do. But they said, come and, come and try it out. So, you know, this is unreal, flying a supersonic airliner versus an open cockpit 1940s biplane. So... Yes, I and you're it's going to be a challenge. Tracy, I want to tell your story. Sorry, I've been talking a lot, folks, but this is what I love about the podcast is, you know, I I, I, I want guests on that I can just share stories with because it's a it's an incredible life. It's an incredible life. But how did you fly, start flying at 16? No, it was honestly, you know, it was a it was a holiday to Canada with my twin sister We'd been raised there. We were there from the age of two till 10. And then we came back to the north of England. But Deb and I went out there in 1978. And while she went shopping one afternoon, I went flying. So I'd seen this sign at the side of the road, introductory flight, $10, whatever it was. So I did my circuit around the airfield. And, and I was just so blown away by all this that the, the young Austrian pilot couldn't get rid of me. And he ended up taking me with him um, on, a, on a charter to Vancouver Island. So I ended up flying all afternoon with him. And, uh, and that was the start of it. I, I obviously went back to school. I was doing my A-levels after that. So it wasn't until I went to New Zealand in 1983. So, you know, five, six years later that I was then working. And I, you know, there was a fantastic, I was actually in Queenstown in the South Island of New Zealand. And there was a fantastic, vibrant aero club there. And it was affordable. It was about a third the amount it would have been in Britain. So I just started doing a few hours. I didn't solo, um, but flying through the Southern Alps, some of the locals would take me flying. We'd be landing on beaches, doing a few aerobatics. And so I had a real taste of it. So aviation is a wonderful flying country, fantastic terrain. And then I moved to Auckland and that's where I started in earnest. So just literally worked my way through a private commercial license, did an instructor rating. But I tell you what I did, Chris. I wanted to fly old ones. I wanted to fly stick and rudder, tail draggers. I did an aerobatic rating. Um, you know, so it was I was just sort of I wanted the wider experience of flying. I wasn't really just interested in flying, you know, tricycle undercarriage Cessnas. And I, I, I had no real plan in terms of an airline career. I I didn't really want that. I kind of went sideways once I started flying the older ones and again joining the New Zealand Warbirds. I'd buy into syndicates. So I bought into my first World War, you know, one was a World War I um, replica, you know, so you could buy in for a few hundred and you actually, it sort of subsidized your flying. And then I, and then, you know, my, I was married in New Zealand. I, I, I married one of, the, one of the guys that I met in the New Zealand Warbirds and he gave me a share in a T6 you know, a T6 Harvard. So I was, in fact, the first woman to fly that in New Zealand after World War II. So it was ridiculous. I featured on the news that night. It was like, <laughs> that's crazy, you know. You know, it's just, it's it's an advanced military trainer. So that was, that was the most advanced one I ever flew. You know, that was a big radial engine, 550 horsepower, retractable, re retractable undercarriage. But great flying in New Zealand, you know, flying with these guys. They'd go and do the air shows. We'd do joy rides for the public. Um, so it, those were really formative years for me. But then I cut the rope and came back to England, you know, and it all started all started from scratch again. You know, it's quite an elitist thing in this country. It always was. And, you know, you've, I mean, that's all I did. I just put all of my money into flying, you know, I, I, and that's one of the reasons I, I think I haven't gone a conventional route in life. I, you know, that was, I suppose, the price I paid to fly you know mm. the price you pay to live the life you want to to live don't you so it didn't allow for children and mortgages and all those normal things you know i just flew and had airplanes and it's expensive here that's another it's um, prohibitive uh, expensive and of course you're also up against the climate and you're sorry that i think that's what i meant to say that yeah. we don't really get the weather here so in florida you can fly all day you know the clouds will come in at the end of the day and even then, there are these big heads of cloud. You can you you can fly yeah, around them. Right. You get the, the thunderstorms in the afternoon, the convection and the turbulence and so on. But you're right. You get you get wonderful clear days, smooth conditions. So it's fantastic for learning to fly. It's very very difficult in Britain. You know, even when I came back and I'd be trying to fly a tiger moth at Cambridge, and I think the first three times I tried to do it, fog, rain, crosswinds. 
it was just nightmarish. You can't, you just can't consolidate and you can't build your confidence with it. it. It just makes it so much harder. And the other thing that's more difficult is that the airspace is so much more congested. So a private license in this country, a, 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 a significant part of that is really instrument flying. Whereas where I was flying in New Zealand, it was still, you know, this is all pre-GPS. You know, I was trained by a World War II navigator. It was all just, mm. you know, wind triangles and, and, you know, it was basic navigation. But it was huge terrain, mountains, coasts, seas. You know, you could obviously you had to go through control zones into, into controlled airfields, but you were also landing on grass strips. And for miles, you, were, you, you could fly without, without having to talk to anybody. Mm. So it was, it was terrific flying in that respect. Are you familiar with the term no rads? Oh, yeah. The, I, it, I, it, yeah. I, I, just to relate on what you're saying, so very congested here in the UK. Also, the 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 uh, um, the legislation governing the whole the, the whole oh, shebang no, is 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 the is, procedure of is it, the procedural aspect mm. of flying here is 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 much. It's much more difficult to fly in this country, and it's much less pleasurable. I must admit, to be perfectly honest, if I was just flying around the south of England, you know, in a in a Cessna, I probably wouldn't bother. To be honest, I feel like I've had such a different experience of flight. Yes, I don't think I'd bother. The no rads thing came around uh, it, 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 in Florida because you've got, say, for example, you've got farmers or ranchers; they've got their land, and they they literally use an airplane like we would a car. They they just want to get around, folks. It's a you know vast distances. Da 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 da, and um, and the no rad thing is. My instructor said, Chris, you've got to be careful of the no rads. There's, there's these old boys. They just don't have a radio in the plane. They don't. You know, they, 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 they're yeah. not bothered about. It. They just take off, go to their mate's ranch. You know, pick up some bales the of hay. Cowboys, or... Chris. They are the cowboys. <laughs> literally, aren't they? They're just out there doing their own thing. Mm. Well, they're a dying breed because you just don't get away with it really anymore, um, unless you're in the middle of nowhere. And then you can do what you like, but predominantly. I mean, yeah, any sort of flying in this country, you know, even low flying, you know, I, I, I do fly <laughs> in parts of the world. I've flown very low in my aeroplane, you know, to capture it for the film, I might add, because, you know, wherever I went, we were also trying to film it so that people could see what it was like to, to be in an aeroplane like this, flying these distances through all this amazing terrain. So I'm down at just a few hundred feet above the deck. But you try doing that in Britain, you'll have all sorts of complaints and you'll have civil aviation on your back, you've broken airspace. It's just, it's it's really tricky. It's really mm. difficult. Have you always, it's the um, Boeing Stearman, isn't it? It's a bi biplane. Is that is that your favourite craft? Was there a reason you 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 chose that? Um, it, Lady Heath, you might want to explain um, who she is. Well, well, just... To talk about the aeroplane first and foremost, I mean, my experience of flying old aeroplanes in New Zealand, because America provided most of the primary and advanced trainers for all the allied air forces in World War II, you know, like the T-6 Harvards and, and, and so on. So that's really what I was trained on. I was trained on Amer American style aeroplanes. And in fact, the, the two that I've subsequently owned, I had a PT-22, which was a primary trainer a little low-wing silver monoplane. So I had that based at Shuttleworth for nine years. Um, and then, of course, I had, you know, I got my Boeing Stearman renovated, restored rather, for my Africa flight. But so there was a generic about flying American airplanes, okay? So it's good rud rudders, you know, it's all steering on the feet. It's good ailerons, good in crosswinds, big open cockpits, you know, whereas British aeroplanes are much tighter. You get into a Spitfire or a Chipmunk and they're sort of wrap around. They're a little bit claustrophobic. Lovely in the handling. But I, I just like American aeroplanes, if I'm honest. And the Boeing Stearman for me was the dream biplane. Big radial engine. I love radials as opposed to the, the British inline engines, if you like. So the big radial engines, round engines, um, and I and again, just the structure of a biplane, you know, all the all the rigging and the struts, you know, it's classic 1920s technology, basically. So I just love, you know, it's 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 wooden fabric. The, the, the airframe itself is tubular metal, but they're very, very strong, very robust. Um, so I just decided that this would be the ideal aircraft for my 
expedition up Africa. So I went through various convolutions to try and find one, rent one, buy one. But in the end, I had one restored with rare bird aviation in, in, in Austria, Hungary. So I found a Stearman specialist and he had, you know, he would buy wrecks in America and, and then restore them to spec. So I had some modifications done to mine. I had extra fuel tanks put in the top wings, which gave me six hours of range. Um, I had a slightly modified, a modified propeller. I had a 300 horsepower Lycoming engine on it because I just needed the extra power for hot, high density altitudes in Africa. You know, sometimes you're taking off at 5,000, 6,000 feet above sea level and you need the extra power to do that with all that fuel on board. And, 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 and you know, and so I was pretty heavily weighted at times. So this was a pretty special airplane, I have to say. And although it was a, an American military trainer, I wanted it to look British. I wanted it to look more period. And I wanted it to look more feminine, actually, because Stearmans are quite rugged, masculine machines. So I had mine painted in British, a sort of British racing green. It's like a, a dark forest green cream wings and then of course i had the union jack on the side and of course the name the spirit of artemis which was my principal sponsor but i wanted it i wanted that kind of female ethos with it and artemis was the goddess of the wilderness and wild animals and i thought wow that's perfect so it was the dream machine absolute dream machine very very straightforward to fly very forgiving and very rugged um, in terms of the pioneer, so here you go. So I wanted to fly Africa. You know, I'd seen the film Out of Africa years ago, the whole love story with Karen Blixen and Dennis Finch Hatton. But it was the sequence of flying that tiger moth through the Rift Valley that just electrified me. I thought, my God, that was just the ultimate in this beautiful, achingly beautiful, romantic kind of setting, you know, in Africa. And I'd, I'd spent all of 82 in Africa um, and came back overland in a Bedford truck. So I'd had some experience of this, but Africa was always the dream to fly that in an open cockpit biplane because of the film. But wind the clock on 25 years, I got my airplane and, and I, was, I learned about the story of Lady Heath. She was the first pilot, male or female, to fly solo from Cape Town back to England. And it's a staggering story. There's a wonderful book by Lindy Norton. It's called Lady Icarus. Well, somebody gave me that book. And the story is, it just blows you away, Chris, honestly. So talk about, talk about a, an interesting background. You know, she was basically orphaned as a baby. You know, her father bludgeoned her mother to death in a drunken fit. He ends up in an asylum for the criminally insane for the rest of his life. She's brought up by her grandfather and paternal aunts. And she goes on to be, and this is in rural Ireland, where she goes on to be a dispatch rider in World War I. She's the, the first woman to get an engineering license. She's the first woman to have a, one of our first female Olympic athletes. And she's also the first woman to get a, a commercial pilot's license. So she's there, you know, haranguing parliament to, for the, the vote, equal rights, but also the right to fly in commercial airspace so that she could exercise the, the rights of her commercial license. So she was a trailblazer in every sense of the word. But the high point of her career was this flight up Africa. So that's what my flight was about, following Lady Heath Root up the eastern side of Africa, Cape Town back to England. And, and that's what she's remembered for. Well, she's not remembered, actually. That was the point. We were making a film because nobody remembers this woman. And we remember Amelia Earhart and Amy Johnson. Nobody remembers Lady Heath. So we, we, we made a documentary. The BBC took that and that screened several times to great reviews, but it was Lady Heath's story. It was called The Aviatrix and the Lady Who Flew Africa. So we were just trying to sort of give her her, her position in the sun, but as this as this iconic modern woman, this was this was the example to this next generation. You know, they need to understand these these people in history. You know, it's all gone before. Whatever they think they're struggling with, it's you know, these are the the people who light the way forward. So, and when you made your journey, did you could you really relate to her experiences? Did you face the similar sort of challenges? Yeah, absolutely. You know, once you're in an open cockpit airplane flying low level and you're dealing with, with weather, you're dealing with obviously heat, distance, uh, what we have, I mean, there's, a, there's obviously a big difference. You know, you're separated by 85 years here. So they were flying with no radios, 
none of the kind of bureaucracy that we're dealing with now. And they were flying predominantly through, through uh, you know, British Empire. So they could wing their way through all this. Um, you know, I mean, things like engineering support, the fuel was there, the oil was there. So Lady Heath was having a marvellous time off Africa. I mean, she had her pearls, her fur coat, she had her tennis racket on board. So she had this lovely social time <laughs> off Africa, which is not to detract from, you know, the, the physical demands of doing a flight like this. You know, she had sunstroke at one point. She she almost fainted in the cockpit and crash landed in, in Zimbabwe. So she had some hair raising moments. And of course, flying through weather on the deck in heavy rain and coming back through Europe. All of those problems are still the same. And weather is still the biggest single issue flying these aeroplanes. So I'm, of course, flying an antique. They were flying the sports planes of their day. Lady Heath was doing this in an Avro Avian. Amy Johnson on her flight to, to Australia, first woman to fly to Australia in 1930. She was flying a, a gypsy moth. So, you know, I was trying to fly, a, you know, fly an aeroplane of a similar type because that's all I'd ever, ever flown was, was historic vintage aeroplanes for 30 years, you know. So, so that was the kind of irony. I, I'm a bit of an anachronism, where, whereas, you know, they were flying the sports planes of their day and probably would have thought I was mad flying in something open cockpit when I could go in something modern. But the disadvantage is now, Chris, flying in a sort of post-9-11 world you know, the cost to do this, the bureaucracy, the security issues, the airspace, you know, so, so that's the stuff we're up against now. And of course, you have to be totally self-sufficient. You've got to, you know, f getting fuel for an airplane like this, you carry all the oil, you have to carry all your spares and, 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 and tooling and so on. So that was just some of the log logistical aspects behind these flights. You have to be totally self-sufficient because there's nothing there for, for you wherever you go, although they charge as if you were a modern airliner. Can I say? But what, uh, you know, what what were the, what were the sort of distances between legs or of the legs? Um, around three three hundred and fifty miles to four hundred and fifty. You know, and how, I, how long does that take you? Well, I'm going at about ninety miles an hour, so I, I would be flying on one leg. Generally, we plan the legs. Sometimes we fly two legs in a day, so you know those were those were with a, with a fueling stop. So I've got 380 nautical miles range in no wind conditions in my aeroplane. So I have to keep landing and fueling. So we generally, we work the legs out at about 300, 300 nautical miles. So you could be sitting in the cockpit for, say, four hours to do that. Mm -hmm. Depends on the wind. If you've got a headwind, obviously, you're slower. Tailwind, you're, you're a bit faster. But you're very, you're very prone to uh, the conditions, the weather conditions. And can you eat or drink? during this time <laughs> you can chris but you can't go to the loo uh, no, I, I, that, that was the question i really wanted to ask on behalf of all our, our um female friends out there because i'm sure they were bust busting do you see what i did there folks busting <laughs> i'm sure they were dying to ask that well yeah so you've got to be a little bit careful you need to keep hydrating so obviously i'd have bottles of water and, and muesli bars i mean i don't like to eat in the airplane because i don't want crumbs in it which sounds a bit precious but in a in a, a tail dragger which is in this you know it's it's on the ground it's almost in the takeoff position so all the crumbs roll to the to the end of the tail and you never get them out again so i was a bit careful not easy to eat crisps in an open cockpit environment, you know, with all the sort of, you know, the dynamic <laughs> airflow around. Gone, it's gone. <laughs> Even sandwiches are quite tricky, but, but yeah. So when it comes to the loo, you just got to be careful. So there are times when I've literally leapt out of the aeroplane and, and you know crouched down behind the wheel, just dying to go to the loo. And, and can I say the pioneers had two, three times the range I did. So when Amy was flying, she had about eleven hours range. As did, as did Lady Heath. So they were going to the loo in the airplane. They were relieving themselves. And, and you know, some of them had little trap doors or, or nappies or however, but it's not really recorded what they did. But I assume, you know, and of course, traveling in space, you have you have suits that remove it all. You know, it's just all sucked away. But but no, I just held on <laughs> in great discomfort at times. What were the ground crews like? You know, it was all very, very good on the ground, you know, because you have to use the, the handlers at the airport. Um, so in general, actually, really very good. I, I, you know, there was, you know, the, the, the problem we had was within our own crew. 
to be honest, a for said logistics manager, you know, so we had to position fuel into places, but there were just complications all the way down the track, stuff that was, you know, not properly organized. And, you know, when you're moving a big crew, we, we had, I say big, we had two aircraft. So I had my steerman and we had a Cessna caravan, but there were eight crew, two aircraft. Now you're moving through this pretty quickly and you're filming. And you're doing interviews and there's media, you know, so there's quite a program around all this. So you need things to slot into place, you know, to, to operate efficiently. So we had problems with that, Chris, to be honest, um, which which caused a lot of conflict and just drained a lot of energy out of us because these were long, exhausting days. You know, we're flying two legs. I'd be, you know, we'd be going from six in the morning till, till midnight sometimes and up again at dawn the next day. So it was exhausting. And... How did the aeroplane perform? The stairman was just brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Didn't miss a beat, didn't miss a beat. So coped with the heat, um, you know, just uh, having said that, I had, you know, a, a brilliant engineering support. Awald Gritch, who restored the aeroplane for me, came on and supported this aeroplane every day he was working on it. So you've got, you know, you're doing putting a lot of time on the engine, there's a lot of vibration. You, you know, you need to check everything every night, all the screws, the wires, the bolts, you know, the fuel lines, the oil lines, uh, et cetera. So you need fantastic engineering support to, to just keep the aeroplane going, actually. Is it um, that particular engine, is it well known for being reliable? Very reliable. One of the most reliable aeroplane mm. engines ever built. They are boat anchors of engines, very, very strong. It's an old-fashioned mechanical, you know, nine-cylinder radial engine. So it's all, you know, you can work on it. And then it was quite amusing, actually, to see the Africans' response to this because they'd look at it, they'd never seen an aeroplane like it. And they thought I was mad. You know, it was like, it, it, you can't fly this. It, 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 it doesn't look, it, it's not going to work because, because all the cylinders are open. It's sort of open engineering, but it looks, it looks as if it, you know, it looks too basic. They thought it looked broken. There was one time I, I was up there and I hit turbulence. Oh, God, yeah. And like you say, these are very small planes, folks. You know, they're Cessnas. They're, they're, they're tiny. It was like go-karts in the sky, really. And and suddenly the plane's just doing what, what turbulence is. It It's dropping and then I'm getting thrown. I tell you what, terrifying. If I, if I could have stepped out of there at that moment, I absolutely, I, I, I feared for my life. I, um, do, do, do you have that kind of thing going on in the back of your mind as you're, like, what if what? it go, go, <laughs> what if it goes wrong? I mean, you well, have turbulence is terrifying. I have to say, and you do get thrown around. I mean, you know. I, when I um, actually, I once had an incident in New Zealand where I was I was instructing. So I, I'm in the, the right hand seat, and I've got you know a student flying the aeroplane on approach in, into the airfield, flaps down. So we're at about 600 feet on the approach, and suddenly again, just the sort of turbulence. It, it, it was funny enough. There were there were cumulonimbus clouds. There were there was a thunderstorm a few miles away, and it was obviously turbulence related with that horrific downdrafts, but suddenly the plane just, it's vertical. And this was like a vertical turbulence, so wind shear. So suddenly we were lurching down, we hit the roof and then slam the other way. And it's so shocking. You, your hands come off the controls. It's completely out of control, basically. So the student is here flying it. And I'm thinking, bloody hell, you know. So I just, I took the controls, powered it up and cleaned the flap up and went round because that's what you're frightened. You're, you're obviously a, a, on, on a, you know, a fairly slow airspeed to come into land. And that's the risk is that you stall it. Mm -hmm. So the, so just powered off, clean, clean the flap up, went round and came into land. And we got out and I was shaking. I was absolutely shaking. But the student said, God, that was terrific. You know, thank God you. <laughs> so he, he thought it was, you know, really exciting, but I was, I it was petrifying, absolutely mm -hmm. petrifying. Because you know what, that's the sort of stuff that throws you into the ground. And you, it's just out of control. There's nothing you can do with that. And, and that does occasionally happen, you know, these microbursts that you hear about. So I've never had anything as bad as that in the Stearman, but, I, but I've had, you know, a lot of turbulence in it, you know. But you just have to sort of hope you've got the altitude, obviously, and try and find smoother air and, and just, 
just press on, really. You know, just tighten the belt, hunker down in the seat and fly through it and hope it gets, <laughs> hope for some smoother air ahead. But isn't that like life itself, Chris? <laughs> yes, yes. It, it, when it's just you, though, it, it's it's always good to share a bit of terror with someone else, isn't it? <laughs> well, listen, often I had people with me, but, you know, in, in you know, but it's, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's one of the least... Uh, fun aspects of, of flying is turbulence, but but there you go. It's just part. Of, actually, sometimes it can be fun if it's a sort of billowing turbulence. It's almost like being, you know, you get these convective waves in, in Africa, you know, flying over the Sahara Desert. And it was a bit like being at sea on a boat. You'd kind of rise up in a thermal and then you'd come surfing down the other the other side of the wave, really. So it was it, it was fun, too. Are you familiar with a gentleman called Steve Fawcett or a late gentleman? Yes, of course. I, yes, of yes course. I had the absolute pleasure to meet Steve he, here in Plymouth um, when he, he'd he got the world record for sailing around the world in the fastest time in a, in, in a, in a yacht crew. I think the boat, boat was called the, the PlayStation or it was at one time in its career. And yep. I remember... I remember hearing about Steve because it was him and Richard Branson, wasn't it, that were trying to fly around the world in in balloons. Balloons. He was that's right, a balloonist as well. Yeah, and whereas Richard Branson had all this money to spend, and he had this luxurious, you know, uh, uh, basket for more than a basket, folks, but you know, this capsule in which he could control his balloon. Did Steve would just get up there, literally in a basket? with a little tiny gas heater um, and he would try and go around the world. And I think they both, um, both failed several times, but yeah. I, um, like I said, I met Steve when he came into Plymouth and, and our, and it was quite upsetting when he went, do you remember he went missing in his light aircraft? Did. Yeah. And there was some debate that it was a, it was a suicide, wasn't it? Well, there was all of that. And it, and the, the search went on for ages and it was kind of acknowledged that in the area where he went missing, which is somewhere in the American wilderness from what I remember. The mountains, that, wasn't it? The, the high Sierra? I, some, I yes. Yes. <laughs> And it was kind of acknowledged, like if you go missing there, the chances of finding you, he, even with the technology of SASTA, is very minimum. I mean, it's just so vast. And but they they did find his plane um, because they found his credit cards, um, and they found, you know, without but getting it was too some time after. It was a couple of years after. Oh, it was a long time after. You know, it was a long time, and I think they. I think the um, theory was he'd he'd hit some um, a, a downdraft basically. Yep. Um, he had again. You know what? Mountain flying. That's one of the what, that's one of the hazards. You've got to be so mm. careful with that, and not to fly in the lee of mountains where you get the sink. You know that sometimes is greater than your your ability to climb out of it. So lots of accidents, lots of flying accidents around turbulence and wind shear and downdrafts. Cape Town to Good uh, was it Goodwood that you flew into? It was Cape Town to Goodwood, it was. Yes. Yeah, I think is that where uh, Boltby is? I can't. I'm... Yeah, they are. They are basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, London to Australia and across the USA. Can you tell us a bit a bit about those trips? Yeah, well, the Australia flight, um, which I did in 2015-16, so it was sort of eighteen months after Africa. So again, just building the more sponsorship and really developing the outreach program that went with it so with boeing on board and, and boeing came on board as my first sponsor because of course it was a boeing steerman but they were absolutely critical to getting this airplane around the world through some quite difficult countries and of course building the outreach and the britain is great campaign which is britain plc so we were able to connect across the world everywhere we flew with schools colleges driving this kind of female program really but i was following amy's flight to australia so amy amy was trying to break the record back in 1930 which stood at at at, at 15 days so that had been done by an australian called bert hinkler so amy again had had a lot quite a bit of you know 
upheaval and, and a bit of personal um, tragedy in her life. And she then finds aviation again, gets her engineering license as well. So she was a very good engineer. And she sets off with less than 100 hours in her logbook to try and break this, this world record. Now, her friends and family thought it was a suicide mission. And in some respects, it, it, it was. You know, there's, there's no doubt about it. I think even Amy didn't care about whether she came back or not. You know, she'd had a broken romance, a devastating romance. Mm. Her sister had committed suicide nine months before that. So there was a lot of emotional issues in the background. Did you do these tapping this morning? Yes, I did a complete overhaul of this yesterday. What about petrol and oil? Oh, I filled both those up. Did you? Right. right, she's all right now. Will you hang on the throttle while yeah. I swing her? Yes, all right. So Amy sets off in her gypsy moth, Jason, and 19 days later, she arrives in Darwin. But this is, this is for my money, it's probably one of the greatest solo achievements in history. I bring messages from the people of England to the people of Australia, and I should be very, very happy if this flight of man can bring together people so far apart, but so near together in, in uh, good feelings, fellowship and friendship and everything except mileage. <laughs> Just the, one, her lack of experience, all she'd done prior to that was fly 200 miles up the English coast from London to Hull. But she sets off with a packet of sandwiches, her toolkit, three people to see her off at Croydon, hundreds of thousands by the time she gets to Australia. But she basically, she has about four crashes on the way. So she does forced landing, she flips the airplane, she ends up in ditches, she gets stuck in monsoons. It is the most amazing story, mm. you know. So, so that's, you know, obviously you can't replicate that. That's not what we were trying to do. Parts of this, I couldn't go, you know, through the Middle East. Of course, there's war. wars were through Syria, Iraq, which, which was where her route took her. So I had to divert south through Saudi Arabia and, and so on and come up through the Gulf and then picked up her track in, in, um, in Pakistan. But yeah, all sorts of adventures in the, in the modern age with, with, as I said, flying in this post 9-11 world, intensely bureaucratic, um, lots of military areas and lots of procedures. But gosh, we had some fantastic, fantastic access, you know, through Boeing and through um, so we made India the kind of centerpiece of the, the flight. I had, I had um, wonderful insurance on my my airplane with GIC Re. So, because of again the long history that England has with India, I thought you know. So I, I made that the, the focal point of it. So visited a lot of schools around there. Um, so that was in fact the most inspiring part of the trip for me, apart from the flying, which was beyond anything. But to go and talk to these girls you know, who were up against all sorts of social restrictions. And I mean, right across, across the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia, in Jordan, in Pakistan, in India, to, to talk to these girls and to see their enthusiasm for this. Um, but so difficult, so difficult for them, really, just to even get an education, never mind flying. But gosh, it was, it was just tremendous. And I hope we captured some of that for the documentary. When you landed in Oz... Did you meet those bloody Aussies and just want to jump back in the plane and fly home again? Look, can I say, the Australians were fantastic. It was like being back in the 1930s because we had a rather a rather bad incident in Indonesia. We got detained there as they, they sort of claimed that our support aircraft had flown illegally through a, through a military area. It wasn't the case. We had a signed authorized flight plan, but we sort of got caught between the civilian air traffic controllers who authorized the flight plan and the military, who were just paranoid about things in their airspace and filming and, and so on. So, so we ran into a wall of problems in Indonesia. They ended up detaining um, the support crew there. So that was my, uh, you know, it was a, it was a Pilatus, um, my cameraman. And so the boys had a, had a, had a pretty bad time there. We flew on in the Stearman. AWOL came with me and we flew on in the Stearman and now putting motor fuel in the Stearman because we had to leave all the, the, the support, you know, the tooling, the spares. We were carrying actually fuel for the Stearman 
in the support aircraft as well. So after that, I was actually putting motor fuel in it. Now, fortunately, the engine runs on that. But we were racing, but, and everywhere we went, we were confronted by the secret police in Indonesia. So this was a, it was pretty traumatic, actually. It was pretty frightening. So I was so relieved to get out of Indonesia. So, and the Australians were great because they allowed us to come into uh, Truscott, which is in the, you know, the Northwest Territories. It was an old submarine base during, you know, an airfield um, in World War II. So they allowed us a sort of non-official immigration entry because I didn't have the range to fly to Darwin. You know, we came in from Kupang into Truscott, refueled, and then flew 400 miles up to Darwin to process properly. And, of course, that was also lame Amy's landfall into Darwin. She came in from East Timor, which we couldn't, we couldn't use again for political reasons. So it's a much more political world now, much more difficult to do this bureaucratically. A little bit of an aside. I, I, I ran the Marathon of the Sands two weeks ago, was it three weeks ago, this 250-kilometre uh, desert race. It's supposed to be the quote unquote toughest foot race on the planet and it i mean like really thought about it <laughs> probably oh, really? probably yeah. what would be a lot of people's crowning achievement I, I i don't know if it hasn't sunk in or whether i'm just a bit spoiled for adventure how has it been for you and what's the reception been like well, I think you do these amazing flights. I mean, nothing like the physical duress you're talking about. I mean, one of the differences, having driven, I've done quite a bit of, um, you know, participated in, in vintage car rallies, you know, from Peking to Paris and having done the overland trip in Africa in a Bedford truck. Heck, it's a lot harder driving it on those roads, you know, and, and deserts and dry riverbeds, you know, just the, the just the physical duress of it and camping out in the bush, you know, five months camping out, much, much harder to drive it. You know, it, it's relatively easy, I have to say, in, in, you know, you're sitting comfortably, you're in the most beautiful aeroplane in the world, flying through breathtaking scenery. I mean, you know, sometimes, look, these are long, hot flights, you get dehydrated, it's tiring. You know, you, you've got a lot of sun exposure. You're in the wind. Um, I had sort of sunburn, dehydration. It, it's, it is exhausting, but, but nothing like as, as difficult as driving it, I have to say. But afterwards, you know, I, I, I look back on the flying. Nothing will ever compare to that. I, I think I was on the roof of my life flying these expeditions. So exciting. I only have to close my eyes and I'm back in that aeroplane with, the you know, the sun flashing off the wings, you know, that that the, the, the singing of the wires and the wind, it's just the most, for me, that's my bliss is being in that aeroplane. So um, nothing compares to that. And, you know, I mean, it, you're right. Things are slightly anticlimactic, I suppose, when you've had that degree of fun and adventure and excitement and, 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 and danger. And, you know, let's not forget that, you know, because I did crash in America. Here I was following the pioneers and following the airmail route there and, and, you know, the, the early airmail pilots called themselves the Suicide Club. Of the first 40 of them, 31 of them were killed. So that's how dangerous the flying was. And then I end up having an engine failure myself in the high desert in Arizona and, and you know, crashing the stem and cartwheeling in and wrecking the airplane. I mean, I was fine and Awal was with me. We were fine. But, you know, the risk is always there. And, and I, I tend to... I tend to, I suppose, minimize the risk. I mean, you know, it's a calculated risk, but at almost any time, you know, this, this can kill you if you get it wrong or if you have an engine failure at the worst possible time, you know, out over the sea or out over mountains, you know, certainly flying in Pakistan. And uh, it was interesting because Amy wrote in her diary flying over these mountains. She was terrified, these razor sharp mountains. I, you know, flying over exactly the same, but also filming it. I was transfixed by the beauty and the savagery of this, but also on some level thinking, bloody hell, if the engine goes here, I'm not going to survive this. You know, so there was a few of those moments. You're always thinking it, Chris, but you sort mm -hmm. of think, you know, it's not going to happen, is it? It's not going to happen. When you crashed, did you did you know you were going to make a crash landing, or or was it? Yeah, yeah. No, the, I was. This was on takeoff, so you know, as a pilot, you'll know it's the worst time you can have an engine failure. Ah, so I see. I, I'm taking off at it. It was a five thousand feet above sea level. Okay, it was Winslow um, in Arizona, and if you do the calculations for the performance altitude for your for your engine, okay, which is what's called density altitude, it was equivalent to taking off at 7,000 feet above sea level. 
Yeah. Okay, so already on an aspirated engine, you've only got half your engine power. This is an airplane that will only go up to 10,000 feet. So you've got half your engine power on takeoff. Okay, so the, the um, um, how that translates is you just have a longer ground roll, okay, to get the speed. And, and it's, it's a, a careful climb out because you've only got really half power. All right. So it's a gentle climb out. So that's what happened. I'd taken off, climbing out gently, only got to maybe 100, 100 feet and suddenly lost 300 RPM on the engine, enough to stop it flying at that density altitude. If I'd been taking off at sea level, it probably it would have been OK. I, I could have come around and just landed and it would have been all right. But you know, given the parameters on the day, it was enough to stop it flying. So suddenly, loss of power, it just starts coming down. There's power lines ahead. I just turned it gingerly through about 30 degrees towards the open desert and flew it into the ground. I didn't have time to do anything. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd leaned the mixture out a bit to, to compensate for the for the altitude. So I just pushed the mixture to full, full rich, thinking, oh, it's fuel. You know, immediately, my thought was, it's fuel. Um, and yeah, flew it into the ground, somersaulted. Um, but of course, you know, the big structure of the wooden wings just absorbed the energy of the crash. You're sitting in the cockpit, sort of in the middle of all this as it rotates around you. So we were absolutely fine. I didn't even have whiplash. I had a little cut on my ankle, and, and as I, you know, the stick slammed into my leg on impact. So I was, you know, I had a bruised thigh, but it was. It was, uh, you know, <laughs> and I, you know, can I say, I didn't think, you know, uh, somebody had, uh, somebody had said to me right at the outset, look, this is, this is a very strong aeroplane and, and understand if you can get this within 30 degrees, you know, coming into the ground, you'll survive it. So that was always in the back of my mind, you know, so I, I didn't think this was a, I, I suppose it was a near death experience, but I never thought it was going to kill me. I wasn't overwhelmed with terror. I was just hacked off if I'm, if I'm honest, hacked off because it was just, it, there was nothing you could do. You, you're just along for the ride at this point. And then it's like, you know, it's like being in a, in a washing machine, basically, when you hit the ground, dirt, dust, noise, you know, horrible. Yes. And I bet it's um, horrible, incredibly disappointing and, and, and quite Dev expen expensive, I would imagine. It's devastating. I, I just, I mean, I love this airplane. This is, this is mm. my, the love of my life. And to see it like that, I just, I mean, I suppose you go into shock. I, I just couldn't really take it in, if I'm honest. The, the devastation was horrific. Mm. Fuel dripping out, because that was the next thing. You think, oh, is the whole lot going to go up, uh, uh, you know, burst into flames? And, of course, the emergency ser services didn't come for about 45 minutes, I suppose. We were you know, a, a mile or so from the airfield out in the desert. Mm. But the boys were circling overhead in, in the Cessna. You know, we had, that was our, that was our, our cameraman and uh, support crew that were there filming it. So, you know, so they could see we were right. I just got up and gave them the thumbs up and, and then waited, waited for the, the rescue people to come. Mm. And they just took, took the wreck back to Winslow. And I had it, you know, it was then taken to Phoenix. They did checks on it. You know, they just cleared out the carburetor, put new fuel in it and got the engine running again. So it was pretty clear what happened. It was contaminated fuel that had just blocked the carburetor. So because there were no injuries, no, no, no deaths, I, I airlifted the, the wreck back to, to Hungary, back to AWOLD in Hungary, and the boys rebuilt it. And a couple of months later, I was, I was at the Farnborough Air Show for Boeing's centenary. So... So it was a very, <laughs> it was a, it was a remarkable, it was a remarkable year, really. Um, but yeah, we were back in the air not long afterwards. So press on, regardless, Chris. You know the, you know the attitude. <laughs> Crack on. What I did want to ask is the the steerman is is that used at all in in crop dusting? Yeah, it was. Listen, tens of thousands of these aeroplanes were built as as primary trainers for World War Two. So they were built in Wichita. Mine was the 1942 one. Um, but yeah, after the war. So, you know, almost every pilot trained on, on Stearmans in America. And of course, they were all over the world as well, I might add. But mm. after World War II, they became crop dusters. And they would then modify them, put bigger engines. They'd have, they'd have tanks in the front cockpit because you fly them from the rear cockpit. So they're not even recognizable. And that's what happened to mine. Mine was a crop duster for years and then was crashed in the 80s and then they will bought the wreck you know he'd go and buy wrecks in america and then and then he restores them on commission 
But yeah, this this is a workhorse of an aeroplane. They're also used for for skydiving and barnstorming, and of course, you know the wonderful formation team here, the Vic Norman setup. Those were those are all steermen's with the girls on the wing, the, the, the four ship formation, which is a fantastic, a fantastic. But that's what they were used for. Mm-hmm. These are these are show aeroplanes, so they're tremendously versatile and and uh, just beautiful. <laughs> yes. Oh well, I have. I think I'm. I've, I've, Pretty sure we're talking about the same aeroplane, but when I did my test, there were a couple of these beautiful craft uh, um, out there at Fort Pierce, and they'd been sold to, I think, I might have this wrong, I think they were Argentinian farmers, and they these two pilots had rocked up at the, air, uh, the airport to fly these things back down south, so from Florida, you know, cro- getting across the Caribbean in, into South America, and there was a c- couple of interesting things there. The, the The first one is they returned within about three hours of taking off, and I I'd, I'd become friends with one of the pilots, and I said, "What what what's happened?" He said, "Chris, I haven't got the skills. I have I haven't got the skills to fly it," and and that was it. He he wrapped his hand in. Um, Really? Um, yeah, I'm not sure what particular skills he was uh, um, referring to, whether it was an instrument thing or something. But but the other thing I got from that is they say that these crop dusting pilots are some of the most acrobatic in the world. They're, they're, totally. They totally. they can just put this plane down at the beginning of a field, drop their, uh, I guess it's pesticide or whatever oh, it is. It's fertilizer. It's fertilizer. fertilizer. Get to the end of the field. Come up. Do this acrobatic turn, and then come straight down in again for the for the it's next. It's just a dumbbell turn. You just do wing over straight back down. So it's very low level. You're carrying huge loads. Um, you know, flying into the sun. You know, you know, and there's lots of crashes. But they're fantastic pilots. Ag, ag pilots operating like that is it's phenomenal flying. Talking of phenomenal flying, let's talk of phenomenal writing because um, it's. It's a bit of a journey, Tracy, isn't it? Writing a book and and um, how's your experience been? Well, look, I did mine over COVID. You know, it's it's pretty rare in life that everything shuts down. So I was there on my own, you know, here in London, and it was the perfect isolation in which to do it. So I just started, um, you know, and and wrote the first tranche in about three months, working every day, seven eight hours a day. And then, and then there was a second tranche as the next lockdown started. So for, for me, COVID was productive, you know, because I couldn't normally do that. I'm just not, you know, to, to you know, writing is, is quite a solitary, it's a solitary, solitary business, isn't it? You know, you need a lot of isolation and, and a lot of undisturbed time. So I had a good COVID in that regard. Yes. Do you know Sir, uh, Sir Ranulph? I do. Yes, I know Ran Fines. Yeah. He's he's a good old chap, isn't he? <laughs> oh, I think he's just remarkable. I, you know, I've been to his his talks. I, I've spoken to for his Trans Globe Foundation. He he's a friend, and he's just a legend. Yes, he's, and that deadpan, understated, low key. You know, but he's a, he's just amazing, amazing. And believe me, the hardships that he has endured. I did once ask him. I said, I said, you know when you consider that you've lost fingers and digits and, you know, all the rest of it, I said, there seems to be a, a high degree of masochism in what you do. I said, are you sort of getting something out of that? I said, is there something, you know, perverse driving you in all this? But actually he's so prosaic about it. It's like, no, no, there was nothing else I, I could do in life type of thing. And, you know, but he just plays it all down that the mm. physical hardship that he subjected himself to is, is beyond what most people can conceive. I've never had anything remotely like that at all and i wouldn't i you know i i wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't go you know put myself down in these remote polar regions with with those sorts of things i i really take my hat off to him i think he's extraordinary he 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 talked about how the bbc cameraman drowned like on the you know first week of the expedition and and he says well that was no great loss or only only the bbc <laughs> <laughs> but i contacted him recently and um I, I said, Saran, would you do me a favor? Would you come on my podcast? Um, he and and uh, 
I said because you're a person that's been all the way around the globe, the Trans Globe Expedition. I, I I remember, you know, reading his his book and uh, and um, I said because there's there's a big, massive, growing movement of people that believe the Earth is flat, <laughs> called flat flat Earth theory, and 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 he wrote back to me what <laughs> he's the second uh, uh anti i've got i've got another friend um uh, uh, friend who was planning a uh um, cross antarctica um expedition and i said I, I, I said i said to him i said baz do you uh are you what do you think of like flat earth theory and he said what i said flat earth theory it's like this theory that the earth's flat it, it's he, he, excuse my French folks, we went, fuck off. <laughs> right. And it it's been was around just... for a while though, hasn't it? It's been around for a while in various guises. And it's it's like, oh, we never got to the moon either. That that was all just a simulation. Well, <laughs> there's 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 so many, you know, it's a complex, we look at them a lot on this show, Tracy, and, and, and you know, some of them are bona fide, some of them are just chucked in there to just muddy the wa waters, I think. But I just think it's fascinating that the world's, what's his accolade? He's the world's most, you know, renowned explorer. And that when I put this to him, he just didn't have a clue what I was doing. He just laughed. He wouldn't yeah. be ready for that kind of nonsense. But the thing about Ran is not only has he done these expeditions all of his life just to sustain that effort year in, year out, but he's also raised something like 20 million for charity. So I don't, I don't think there's anybody quite like him. I think he's just he's just one out the bag, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but, um, you know, give let's give some... All credit to you, Tracy. I mean, you've, uh, you know, you're you're not one for holding back either, are you? Well, it, it look in, in a, on a rather more modest level, I think. But uh, you know, uh, look, you know, I had sort of ten years of expeditions, and you know, I I hope I've still got one left in me. But um, but no, I I could never have done you know a whole life around that. You know, just just organising and raising the money for it. That alone. Is just such a demanding um, thing. Mission itself is, is 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 the straightforward part, to be honest. For the most part, it's actually getting everything in place, and 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 it, that's the I think the difficult part. And I think Rand would probably echo that. Although he's now so renowned, of course, that I'm sure you know you know people, as he'd say right from the outset, he would never pay crew. If people wanted to come with him, he would you know he would select them, hand pick them. You know, I wish I'd be more careful with my crew selection as well, believe me. But it was interesting to read about his comments about crew and the, the dynamics and psychology of a, of a crew, of a crew. Yeah. yeah, he's really he's really had some experiences there, hasn't he, with where it's yeah. all gone a bit wrong? Yes. Do you experience a sense of euphoria once you actually take off and all of the planning and, and the fundraising and the promotion? It, it's that's all done now. Right, I'm on my mission. And and as your wheels take off the runway, is that that? Absolutely, that's the point. You know, you the, you know, as soon as your wheels are off, you're airborne and climbing up. Elation is that I think it's it's beyond it's beyond happiness. It's just it's just another world. And uh, you know, then suddenly you're looking down on everything, and you have this wonderful objectivity with it as well. This perspective. On everything, on on life, on on the, the, the terrain, you know. So I, yeah, that, that's that was the, the the best part for me, really, just taking off and being in that aeroplane. And then, of course, the minute you land again, and it would all start again, all the ground stuff, all the paperwork, all the cost, all the etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, you know. And what's the what's the next plan, Tracy? Anything in the pipeline? Chris, the next plan, having launched the book, so that's out, that, that launched at the end of March. Um, I'm just getting the film finished. That's been a long process, interrupted by COVID, um, but I've been funding all of that, so it's been a long, uh, difficult. These things are just so difficult to do to privately make a film like this, but we're putting the finishing touches to that this week, and my hope is that that is released um, um, the next, by the end of the summer, say. 
um, to the, go. What, book, what's the book, name? It's Bird. So it's Bird the book and it's Bird the film. And there will be a musical to follow after that. So <laughs> Bird is the word. <laughs> um, the film, is it about all, all your trips or one in particular? No, it's about all of them. It's mm. it's the global, you know, so there's a bit of Africa, Australia, America, the two trips to America, because, of course, after I crashed, um, took the um, ship, the steerman back to Los Angeles and then reflew America again. So two attempts at America. So it's all of it. And it's the pioneering story as well. So it's it's Lady Heath, it's Amy Johnson, and it's also Amelia Earhart. So I really focus the story around the three the three most iconic female aviators f- for me. Incredible. Incredible. Tracy, do you have like a, any sort of social media that people follow you on or is... Oh, I need to get organised. It's, it's, it's being done by the publisher at the moment, but I, I need to crank this up. I, I'd rather disengage. I've never, I've never engaged with, with social media, but I know that's obviously the world we now operate and that's how people communicate. So I need to actually start doing that because there's loads of material i mean you know there's loads of stuff going on that 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 would be great to share with people yeah exactly i I, i'm only saying it from the perspective of sharing there'll be there'll be people across the board that will be fascinating all aspects of, of of your life and your story and your flying and your planes um but uh only wondered because we'd put your links below the video but uh um as it as it as it is, folks, we're going to put a link for Tracy's book, Bird. Um, grab a copy. Yep, it's uh, it's out there. Bird is out there. Yes. So, but listen, thank you. This has been this has been really uh, tr- unreal, it's- unreal. I uh, get to chat about something that I really enjoyed doing, which was flying. I haven't done a lot of it, Tracy. I just wanted to say that I, I've done that in my life. You know, I, 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 I know a bit about that now. How many, hours, how many hours have you got now? Oh, gosh, not uh, whatever the hours it was to to pass the the thing. That, I had that 50 hours. Now yeah, some, something of- like that. Um, I was a little bit longer flying solo than most because some people fly solo after sort of 10 hours. I, I was about 18 and I was just new to it. Oh, I had no background in aerodynamics. I hadn't studied. So I rocked up in uh, America, Tracy, with no, no experience, just just like I want to learn to fly. And And I honestly had this. The only thing I could relate it to, obviously, was driving a car because that's the only other machine really that I'd have ever taken charge of that. And, you know, a motor motorbike. And I, I honestly didn't get the aerodynamics that when you come into land, you're, you're a bird, you're flaring like this and you're, you're slowing your descent through the air. And then you're landing on this cushion, just like a, a bird when it lands on the lake and you see that, that beautiful motion. I didn't know that. I thought you're kind of like up here driving a car sort of thing, but in the air. And when you want to go down, you just point it down. And drive it on. Yeah, yeah. like the Dukes of Hazard, and you just go, yeah. And you, you. And of course, I, f- I was failing every landing, and my bloody rubbish instructor just could not s- understand that he hadn't taught me anything. He hasn't taught me none of this. He's just, right, da, 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 and you know, you're, you're under a lot of stress and you're, you try not to panic and you, 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 you listen to him, but it's completely counterintuitive to what your brain is saying, which is just, you just go down like that. Anyway, I was very fortunate. I, there was a, an Austrian guy on my course. Or, or, Another uh, Austrian. <laughs> yes. He was called Appy. Um, very, very decent chap. Anyway, he, he actually failed his, uh, he failed his exam, which was quite kind of like, Oh my God, if he's failed it, what am I, you know, one of those kind of scenarios. Yeah. But I came back to the the shared apartment we have one day and I'm just like throwing down my, my study books. And he's like, what's the matter? I said, this is blooming landing, Appy. I, 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 I just can't get it. He said, did he tell you to flare? I'm like, I didn't know what he was talking about. I'm like, no, he said, <laughs> That's why you're struggling. It was the same with me, Appy said. He said, Chris, you've got to pull back on the stick. You know, you're you're, la- you're trying to land on this cushion of air. Ah, right. 
after that moment, Tracy, it all made sense. But had my instructor taught me anything about no, and and that's why there was this this disconnect between me and the instructor is he he knew what he's talking about. Yeah. I only know the like the Dukes of Hazard thing that's in my head. And once I got that, then it, it it's it's a it's a different story, isn't it? Then 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 I could land on the runway, literally not put put the nose wheel down, just stay on the back wheels, go the length, of, and then t- and and then do a go around. It it, it was it, I I just felt ah I get it now, not just the landing, but I get flying. I get what it's about. It's not like driving a car in the sky. It is n- no no. There's a, there's a bit of finesse in that in that final touchdown point. But you're right. We used to say. Don't, you know, try and just hold off, hold off as the speed washes away. Try not to land. And yes. that's the best way to achieve, yes. to achieve a, a landing. But it's the, hard, it's the hardest thing for anybody. I'm just sorry you've had a, a lousy experience with it. All of us at any stage can make a lousy landing. So that's, mm-hmm. that's flying. It can be terribly leveling in that regard. You know, you can get out and just think, oh, dear God, how is that possible? I can yeah. do that now in the steerman, just catch a a bit of side wind or sink, whatever, whatever, for whatever reason, you know, and you'll get a bounce and think, damn it, you know. It's been absolutely just amazing talking to you. Thank you so, so much. I wish you all the best with uh, your book and the film. Links below, folks, for the book. Um, Really uh, look forward to welcoming you back on the podcast and we can chat again at, at, at another time. We've probably just covered covered half of it. But stay on the um, on the Zoom just so I can thank you properly after I push the record off. But for the purposes of the recording, huge congratulations. Thank you for everything that you, um, you know, that, that you've done in the area of women's rights and and just getting out there and living your life and uh, as we say, the name of the podcast, bought, Buying the T-Shirt. Thank you so much, Chris. Pleasure. You're welcome. So I hope it inspires some of you to do what I did, which is get down to the news agent, grab a flying magazine, have a look in the back in the adverts, and call up a flight school. You don't have to commit anything. Just call them up, have a chat, and... You don't have a trial flight. Absolutely. Do it. Do it. Much love, friends. See you soon.